Right from the start, the Super NES was designed to be enlarged, extended, engorged by enhancement chips. Extra stuff jammed in the cartridges to make the games better, bigger and bolder. And yes, that's what I'm looking at in this video, how enhancement chips took the SNES to new heights and made some of its best games possible. Well, that's the plan anyway, although sometimes working out what it is these chips actually do isn't easy. But let's go big right away and start with Super Mario Kart. A game that I don't really need to introduce, do I? The inaugural member of one of Nintendo's very biggest selling franchises. A perennial favourite that's as big now as it ever was. Released in 1992, this makes use of Nintendo's DSP-1 chip. Not the first game to do this, actually. Pilot Wings from nine months earlier has that honour, but Mario Kart was definitely the bigger hit. But we've already got questions, haven't we? What the hell is the DSP-1 chip and what on earth does it do in Mario Kart? Yeah, it might not be so easy to see what this thing brings to the table. It's not the Mode 7 3D graphics, plenty of games manage that without any special chips, including launch title F-Zero. Maybe it's the split-screen two-player stuff that this is needed for, but no, Street Racer from 1994 manages that just fine without any extra help. Heck, it even manages a four-way split in some modes. In fact, Street Racer makes a pretty good comparison here. It's a Mario Kart-inspired racing game that seems to have near enough all the features of Mario Kart, and it manages it without any kind of enhancement chip at all. Developed by British company Vivid Image and published by pre-assassin obsession Ubisoft, Street Racer got rave reviews when it was released. People said it was better than Mario Kart. It's not, of course, but it is a decent game, even if it contains some national stereotypes that would not fly today. But is this just a case of brilliant coding that Nintendo couldn't match? Why would they bother with the expensive extra circuitry if you can achieve all this without it? Perhaps Mario Kart isn't using its fancy enhancement chip at all. Maybe it's just for copy protection. I've heard it said before, could it be? Let's do a little bit of reverse engineering and find out something about what's going on. If you've seen my last NES video, you'll remember the event viewer from the fabulous Messen emulator. And that luckily for us, its SNES cousin Messen S has the exact same feature. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, well this is a debug feature that overlays information about what's happening internally in the game's code over the graphics display, very useful for all kinds of things. Here I've set it up so that it shows whenever the DSP chip is accessed by the main CPU, and you should be able to see quite a bit of activity in the form of those dots. If I go frame by frame, it's a bit clearer. Yes, the DSP chip is being dinged quite a lot. It must be doing something, but what? Well, a bit of background research might make things a bit clearer. There's not much info about this chip online, but there is some. This chip, it turns out, seems to be like a digital oracle. You give it questions, it gives you answers. Unlike the oracles of old, this isn't just vague pronouncements about Spartans, but the solutions to mathematical calculations. A quick peek at the leaked official Nintendo documentation on this gives some clues as to what this entails. I probably shouldn't be looking, but I'm sure you won't tell anyone, will you? Multiplication, trigonometric functions, and a whole lot of stuff related to 3D space, and that's what this DSP chip is doing. You ask it a question by writing a command number to address 6000 and then send the data you want it to do the calculation with and some time later, in the order of microseconds, out pops the answer. This is very useful, not only is it quicker than having the SNES CPU do these calculations, it's also much easier on the programmer too. You don't need to be able to write the code to do these things, it's already done for you by this chip. A double win, faster and easier. But what are these calculations being used for? That's the final question. Well, I said that Street Racer had near enough all the features of Mario Kart, but well, it doesn't quite manage every one. The tracks are simpler, with fewer obstacles, there's no pipes or moles to get in the way, and there are fewer types of terrain. 
The handling of the carts is less complex, there's no power slides and this has to be a big one, there are no projectile weapons. No homing red shell, no bouncing green shell or anything like that. And that is what the DSP chip is doing, it's adding the calculating capabilities that are necessary for these features. The SNES has its well-known Mode 7 graphics and for a more thorough explanation of how they work have a look at my last Super NES video, but in short the drawing part is easy for the Super NES, but working out exactly what it is that should be drawn soon gets complicated. The missiles and the obstacles and all the other features add to the complexity of what's going on, and the DSP allows all this stuff to happen and still keep that frame rate high in a fast paced game. There were quite a few kart races on the Super NES, no surprise given the success of Mario Kart, but from what I've seen I don't think any of them were so sophisticated in their features. It's such a well-known game it's easy to take it for granted, but Mario Kart does a lot that I don't think any other games managed. Around 15 games all told made use of the DSP-1 chip, many of them Japanese exclusives, including quite a few racing games like Shutoku Battle 2 here. Also more unique stuff like Aim for the Ace, based on the manga of the same name, I can't get the hang of this at all, but it is unusual one of the few Mode 7 games that really try and make use of 3D space. I feel like this is what I'm going to come back to though in some other video because it really is interesting. Interesting. But things could get a bit murky here if I'm not careful, the function of a lot of SNES enhancement chips is a bit more obscure than the DSP-1. The DSP-2 chip that makes its sole appearance in Dungeon Master does something with graphics, but what it is I really can't tell. Unlike Mario Kart, it seems to have no advantages whatsoever over its chipless alternatives like Eye of the Beholder. Mega Man X 2 and 3 have the CX4 chip which apparently adds these blink and you'll miss it wireframe effects and also does something with sprites. Whatever it is, it doesn't look like anything the also chipless prequel Mega Man X 1 didn't do already. Would companies really add enhancement chips that seem to do a bit more than sod all but not that much? Well it kinda looks like it. But let's not worry about that, let's head to the much safer ground of the Super FX. Yeah, this is more like it, there's no doubt that this is doing something totally awesome, radical, bodacious and whatever 90s chewed terms you want to throw at it. Star Fox here is the one that everyone remembers the game the Super FX was built for in the first place. Created by British company Argonaut Software in tandem with Nintendo themselves and released in 1993. It's a fine game but everyone talks about Star Fox don't they, how about we look at something different, how about we take a look at Vortex. A game also created by Argonaut Software but this time on their own without Nintendo. Released a year later you could sort of think of this as Star Fox 1 and a half, a space shooter that doesn't have the animal mascots but well it's hard not to see the parallels. You're playing as a giant transforming mech in more open environments, less of the on rails stuff, ideas that Star Fox 2 explored later but more on that shortly. This game features as good 3D graphics as you could ever expect for the first incarnation of the Super FX chip, with some large environments and some very nice texture mapping. Yes, Star Fox had a bit, but this has quite a bit more. It's really tough and not as polished as Star Fox, but it has its charms and is worth delving into. What is it though that the Super FX actually does? What makes it go? Well at its heart the Super FX chip has a custom 16 bit CPU designed for dealing with graphics and that's what it does, draw the graphics, not all of them, the main console deals with stuff like the backgrounds as well as dealing with the sound inputs and other stuff, but the 3D polygons are drawn entirely by the chip. In fact with a bit of emulator magic I can show you just the Super FX bit, where it becomes pretty obvious what it's doing. The thing is though, these Soupy Fox games never really have that good of a frame rate, do they? And the 3D models are hardly detailed. It's all a bit bare bones and even 10 frames per second seems optimistic. Why is that? 
Well, let's dive into this game's insides a bit with some emulator debug features and we'll have a look. We'll start with watching the Super FX chip output as it's actually doing its thing. This tile view window shows us the graphics being laid down by the chip in the dedicated RAM built into the cartridge. Right now we're watching it at full speed, but we can drop into frame by frame and see the image built up bit by bit. Yeah, it's messed up, but what we're seeing here is the graphics ordered in the way they're stored in this bit of memory, not the way they end up on the screen. It looks like it's taking three or four frames worth of time to construct a single complete frame. The super effects just can't do it any faster. We can even drop down even slower and see individual lines of pixels being laid down. I wish I could show you a more intuitive view, but I just can't make that happen at the moment. Okay, then it's taking three or four frames time to create one frame. That's what, 15 or 20 frames per second then? Well, it would be, but there's something else that gets in the way. You see, for an image to be displayed on the screen, it needs to be sent to the console's video RAM to be turned into a TV signal. And the SuperFX can't do this itself. It doesn't have direct access to this RAM. The main CPU has to do this transfer, moving the graphics generated by the SuperFX, and it takes a while, about another three frames, in fact. We can see this process happening via the event viewer going frame by frame. Those purplish dots at the top and bottom of the screen represent the graphics data being moved. Notice how the bands of dots don't overlap with the graphics on the screen? Yes, the CPU can't write to the video RAM whilst it's displaying graphics. It has to be done in the short time between frames. The generated graphics don't quite fill all the area they could to allow for more time for transfers and the chip also automatically puts out graphics in the exact right format for them to be displayed without any extra work, which helps too. When you add all this together, well, you'll find that it's taking six, seven, eight or more frames sometimes to actually get anything to appear on the screen, meaning the effective frame rate is often less than 10 per second. Couldn't some of this stuff be done concurrently, have one frame being copied over whilst the other's being drawn? That would make things quicker, definitely, but unfortunately here, there isn't enough RAM to set up that kind of buffering, a problem that several of the early Super FX games seem to have. All told, there were five games released for the original chip, two space shooters that we've seen, and three off-road racing games. Ideas must have been in fairly short supply and well, they, they're all three kind of okay, but probably mostly got along on novelty value. Dirt Tracks here was fine, but the best of them I'd say was Stunt Race FX, developed once again by Nintendo and Argonaut. It's still not that wonderful though, an early experiment in inducing motion sickness and confusion in the gamer before they really perfected it with the Virtual Boy. It's improved massively by overclocking the Super FX chip, which is dead easy on an emulator and just about possible in real life too, or so I understand. Higher clock speed means higher frame rates and actually it makes it quite a bit more playable. But anyway, speaking of overclocking the Super FX, that's exactly what Nintendo did for real with the Super FX 2, an upgraded version of the chip with twice the clock speed. Three games were released with this on board, well actually four, but the last one, it took a while. There was Doom of course on display here, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, SNES Doom is Doom on the SNES, and that's what it is. It's not the finest version of Doom, that's true, but on the other hand, considering the hardware, it's pretty amazing. But don't listen to me talk about it. Go and watch Modern Vintage Gamer's video on the subject. He seems to know what he's on about. I should also probably mention Winter Gold, the only Super FX2 game to be released back then that actually featured 3D polygons. It looks impressive, it's certainly got a bit of style, but well, it's not overly endowed with substance. It's still kind of interesting though, and this is something that I might come back to one day. But neither of these are the best that the Super FX had to offer. These next two games are really the pick of the litter. So let's say hi, first of all, to Star Fox 2. Yes, the massive sequel to the original game that started Nintendo's journey into polygons. Cancelled and unreleased for 22 years for reasons that were entirely transparent and not at all baffling at the time. This game never saw public release till 2017, bundled with the Super NES Classic. 
It turned out to be a canny move in the end, though those cunning buggers released in 95 or 96, it would have looked very last gen to anything on the PlayStation. Give it a couple of decades though, and it's a lost classic that helped dig Nintendo out of a hole. That's why they're keeping Earthbound sequel Mother 3 on ice. If the neural link on the new Switch U turns out to be unacceptably lethal, well, the Game Boy Advance Classic can tide them over till they get their Power PC based holodeck online. But anyway, the game is good, but if you're the kind of person who watches my videos, you know that already, don't you? Of course, no actual cartridge was ever produced of Star Fox 2, officially at least, but there are various ways of getting it on a physical cartridge, and it does run just fine, completely unmodified on a real Super NES, so I think it's fair to look at it with other SNES games. It's got quite a bit of texture mapping, lots of polygons, and some really quite complex environments. In fact, it seems like a lot of the ideas tried out in Vortex were brought to fruition here. And we've also got quite a noticeably improved frame rate. It's capped at 20 and often doesn't reach that anyway, but it is better. This time, not only do we have a processor with twice the speed to draw those graphics, but we have twice the RAM in the cartridge, enough to set up double buffering. As you can just about see here, there's two images in the video memory, one being constructed whilst the other one is transferred to the video memory to be displayed on the screen. This improves things speed-wise and eliminates quite a bit of wasted time. You don't need to wait for one task to be completed before you start the next one. In this game, there is of course absolutely no doubt what the Soapy Flax enhancement is doing. There's no way the Super NES could even come close to handling this without it. But that might not be true for the next game. Yes, what about, what about, there's one game I haven't mentioned yet. It's Yoshi's Island. A top tier title, one of the finest 2D platformers of all time. It's just got everything going for it. A unique and unforgettable art style that's managed to look really fresh on an ageing console, and that's inimitable, razor-sharp Nintendo game design all the way through. It's a pearl indeed. But does it actually make use of the Super FX chip? I mean, it's just a 2D platformer. There's no need for co-processors there, surely? Is it doing anything with this fancy chip, or is it, as some have suggested once again, elaborate copy protection? Maybe they just had a warehouse full of the damn things and they wanted rid of them. It's not even got the Super FX logo on the box. Give the cartridge a shake and you'll hear that chip rattling round in there. They didn't even bother gluing it to the circuit board. It's a con. Things you might hear from hardcore video gaming conspiracy theories that I've just invented. But without getting bogged down in further hyperbola, the Super FX might not at first seem to be doing much here, but let me tell you, it is. Like what, for example? Well, like right here on the title screen, a brilliant marriage of classic mode 7 for the revolving island at the bottom, with all the rest of the stuff, the mountains and trees and what have you being drawn, placed and revolved with the right perspective by the Super FX as sprites. In most other games, the Super FX doesn't bother with sprites or the 2D moving objects, instead of painting its polygons as background graphics. But there's no reason why it can't do stuff like this, and there's lots of it in Yoshi's Island. Tons of rotation effects like this spinning spiky thing from a boss dungeon, and yes, we can see it being drawn in the memory. A lot clearer this time out too, it just all happens to line up. And here with Submarine Yoshi, we have the same thing going on. Although with Mode 7, the Super NES could rotate the backgrounds, it was never able to do it with sprites. So these sorts of effects you didn't often see on Super NES games, unless it was carefully set up and limited. But there's loads of examples here. This Rolling Rock is another one. And yes, these are small details, but there wouldn't be a realistic way of doing this so smoothly without the Super effects. Another thing that is really striking are these 3D doors that appear in castles, and it's maybe not done in the way you'd expect it. Rather than drawing these as polygons, they are, well, it's kind of weird. 
The doors look like this, stored in the memory, yet yeah, too strange triangle. The Super FX, in tandem with the stock SNES features, creates these falling doors by cutting up the triangles into strips and rearranging them. It's not easy to explain, but I think the Super FX is creating offset values that are fed into the vertical scroll register, which arranges horizontal strips of the triangle in the memory into arbitrary shapes. And if you're wondering what the hell that means, well, in short, this squiggly stuff here plus those weird triangles equals doors. It also somehow equals these rotating barrels too. This is a really clever technique that's not quite like anything I've seen before. It's like a 2D driving game engine gone mental. Why is it doing it this way? It's hugely efficient. Remember other FX powered graphics maxed out at 20 frames per second, but this animates at the full 60. Doing it this way means there's less data to transfer from the Super FX to the video memory, so it can update the animation every frame. That's what really makes this amazing. I'm guessing whoever came up with this at Nintendo was the same big brained maverick who realised Star Fox 2 would make more money if they sat on it for 22 years. It's so deviously brilliant. A lot of stuff in this game turns out to be very clever manipulation of weird triangles when you start digging around in it. This, whatever this weird platform thing is, this boss. This boss and many others, including this insanely invented fight inside a frog's stomach. In fact, I think every boss fight in this game uses the Super FX in some way. It's drawing, rotating and processing stuff that would otherwise be impossible on the base machine. The enhanced effects in Yoshi's Island are often subtle, but they are absolutely all over the place when you start looking. Yes, even the famous touch fuzzy get dizzy is powered by the Super FX. And okay, this and maybe some of the other stuff could be done without enhancement chips to some degree. Some stuff could be made less processor intensive at the expense of more memory, and some things could maybe happen with some compromises. But here's the thing, Yoshi's Island fills the screen and runs the game at 60 frames per second nearly the whole way through. With the best will in the world, even the limit-pushing Star Fox 2 looks a bit like a janky relic from another age now. Yoshi's Island, on the other hand, still looks so great, it's hard to see how it could be improved all that much, even with today's technology. In the end, I think the old slimy fix had a lot of wasted potential. Only three or four really good games came out of it. There was just so much more that could have been done with it, particularly outside of polygonal 3D. By 95 or 96, yes, the PlayStation was just unstoppable, making the Super FX and the Super NES old news, but I'm surprised more games didn't use it before then. Relatively speaking, a lot of games appeared on the 32X and Sega CD, even if they were often pretty forgettable. But no one seemed quite so keen to use what was maybe Nintendo's answer to these developments. Maybe price was a factor. What do you think? Well, let me know in the comments below. So I think this is where I'm going to cut all the time for now, but this can't be the end, can it? What about the Super Accelerator, the SA1? What about the homebrew enhancement chip, the MSU one? What about all those other weird chips that people crammed into Super NES cartridges for oblique and inscrutable purposes? Well, that's going to come in part two. Yes, I think I need to split this one up. There's so much to be said about this topic, so look out for another Super NES video on the way very soon. Or soonish, anyway. I'm going to sign off for now thank you so much to my ever generous and wonderful patrons your support really makes a difference if you'd like to join them that would be great link below and i'll see you next time folks thank you for watching